Hello, my name is Joan Borton and I work with Loop 14 Exchange. There are handouts that go along with this workshop, which you can find at uh, the Family Cafe or with a link on YouTube. And there you'll find my contact information. Would love to, to connect with you since we have to do this uh, session virtually today. But this session that you joined me for, and thank you, is caregiving when you just don't care. Now, typically, I don't wear a t-shirt when I'm doing my speaking, but I thought this was appropriate for today. It says, I am a caregiver. That means that I live in a crazy fantasy world with unrealistic expectations. Thank you for understanding. And I imagine many of you listening who are caregivers give a hearty amen to that because you may feel the same way. And while maybe you looked at the title and said, well, it's not really that I don't care for my loved one that I'm providing caregiving services for. It's just that I'm empty. And that's really more the truth of it. It's not that we stop loving or caring for the person we're, we're caring for. Some days we just feel empty. We feel like we don't have anything left to give, but we still have to. We're still family caregivers. So this is a time where I just wanted to share with you a few strategies that I've learned over my 25 and a half years of caring for my husband, Jerry. He was born with cerebral palsy, so I knew I was going to be a caregiver when we got married. I didn't think it was going to be any big deal because I had been a paid professional caregiver in a number of different situations prior to getting married. So I thought, oh, I've got this down. I know what we do as a caregiver. Well, as you may know, the difference between a paid professional caregiver and a family caregiver is really a, a different ball of, of wax as the saying goes. You know, at the end of my shift as a paid caregiver, I went home. But as Jerry's fond of saying, at the end of the day, you get to take me home. You know, home is wherever I am with him and my role as a caregiver doesn't stop. Now I know 25 years that I've been doing it's a long time, but for some of you, You've been caregiving a lot longer than that, 40, 50, even 60 years. Kudos to you, thank you. But I know that's a long time, and I know that sometimes the struggle of IEPs or ordering new medical equipment, the couple year wait it takes sometimes for that, getting uh, current equipment you have repaired and used well, insurance pre-authorizations, waiting on phones for a doctor call back, all those kinds of things. They seem like they're never going to end. And they're the things that often wear us out and make us tired and worn. So while I want to provide hope and encouragement, I want us to just for a few minutes, camp out a little bit to acknowledge the feelings that we experience as caregivers. I think sometimes we wonder, is this just me or does everybody feel this way? And while everybody probably doesn't feel this way all the time, we all certainly experience some of these feelings in different times. So, so, we're not going to stay here long, but to know that it's okay and you're, you're, you're normal, you're typical if you experience burnout, let's say. Just going through the motions. I, I've done this for so many weeks and months that I just can't do it anymore. Maybe depression. Not necessarily clinical depression, though if you think you're experiencing that, please seek professional help. We all need to do that from time to time. But I'm talking about that feeling of sadness and the loss of interest. It just kind of is like makes me feel like I'm slogging through jello to do my normal activities. Now tired, <laughs> maybe even bone wearying exhaustion. We've probably all felt that and perhaps are even thinking it now. I just need some more sleep or a few minutes to do nothing, but I can't because maybe you're a single parent and your child doesn't ever stop or your spouse has dementia and is wandering off. And so you have to constantly be on your guard. It's hard to get those breaks and that sleep that we need as caregivers. And even if we do from our caregiving jobs or roles, there's also a lengthy list of those personal and household things that we still need to do. Sometimes I've hit a feeling of hopeless. And sometimes that comes from the loss of a dream, maybe for your child, for your spouse, what you thought your marriage or your family life would be like. And it just comes and goes. Um, maybe it looks different than how you thought it would. And so you might feel like you don't see a future or a hope, but there is one. And I just want you to know that, um, that those feelings can be, can be temporary. You know, take that and try, employ some of these strategies to find that hope to go on again. How about boredom? 
if I hear that same question one more time, or watch the same rerun of a TV show, or a game that my child will play incessantly over and over again, or how many times do I have to repeat this routine to him? Um, we become bored because we just have done it so much. Then there's sometimes comparison that raises its ugly head where we look and we say, oh man, I just saw on Facebook and my college roommate and her husband just redecorated all their house and now they've bought a beach house for their vacation property or you have a sibling or a neighbor who's in the empty nest years and you realize you probably will never be in the empty nest years. So comparing our lives to others is a difficult kind of thing. Perhaps you've heard the uh, analogy that when you do that, you're like comparing apples to oranges and they're just not the same because we're seeing what we perceive to be their life all the time when we look at their Facebook post or whatever else and we compare it to what we know the reality of ours to be and they're never going to measure up. So try to let go of that comparison because it's just not an equal uh, kind of thing at all. But I know that's also easier to say than do because even recently I've struggled with some comparison myself. And then sometimes we feel lonely, which leaves us feeling empty and that we may not care. For me, this sneaks up on me when Jerry has a few days where he needs to get extra sleep or, or more rest. And I just am like, well, what do I do? I kind of need to stick around. I can't go too far in case he needs something while he's in bed. But I also just, I just need a break. I need a change of pace. Or maybe the one you care for is nonverbal and you long for a conversation. Maybe you reached out to a friend and they just didn't get it and it made you feel even lonelier. So all these feelings alone are not the problem. The problem is when we camp into any of these for a long time. If we can recognize that these are part of the natural rhythms and ups and downs of life, it's okay to, to spend a little bit of time there and then, um, and then try, employ a strategy to help us move forward. So when these feelings morph into the thought of, I don't matter, I'm just a caregiver, that's all I am, we feel used and unappreciated and we want to quit. Excuse me, I'm, I wish we were in a room together because I'd love to hear your stories of times when you've been like that. So please contact me by email or phone, which you'll find at the end of the, this presentation. But I'm gonna tell you one of my stories. It happened many, many years ago but it's still one that rings so true with Jerry and I. I had no more emotional bandwidth left. We'd had a long couple of months. On Saturday, I was going to host, or I did host, the largest event that, that the ministry I worked with did each year. It took months to prepare. It was for caregivers. And that same weekend, Jerry was going to attend a conference out of town. He had a friend traveling with him, both as his traveling companion and as a personal care attendant. At home, my mother lived with us. She'd been with us for a number of years now. She didn't need physical care, but at that point, she did look forward to us being home to talk with her often. And some days I handled that need of hers for companionship better than others. Well, when this busy day ended on Saturday, it was about dinner time. I went home and I just fell asleep. I was exhausted. Jerry got home sometime late that night, or maybe it was even early Sunday morning. I don't really know. Uh, we both needed to sleep late on Sunday, but mom was going to be heading out for a couple weeks with my sister that morning. So I set my alarm to get up and to say goodbye to them and then go back to bed. I realized as I went back to bed that while I needed this break from mom, I also was going to be bearing more responsibility because mom managed a lot of the household tasks at that point in our family life. And I didn't even think about how much that was going to add onto my time. But I began to think about it that morning when I had no more emotional bandwidth. So this became too much for me. And when I returned to bed, <clears throat> excuse me, as my exhausted and drained head and heart hit the mattress and the pillow, the tears began to flow. It didn't take long for them to become full body sobs. What, what's going on, do you know? Jerry asked gently while lying in bed. I don't recall what, if anything, I said right away. He held me as I wept. The truth was, I was done. I'd given 
everything, um, my social, my emotional, my mental, my physical, even my spiritual reserves were empty. I could not help myself, let alone help anyone else. With a deep level of compassion and probably a little fear and trepidation on his part, Jerry calmly said, it will be okay, sweetheart. We'll get through this together. That was the final straw. That last tiny piece of my emotional dam broke loose and I cried, not in my most loving tone. Sure it will. It's easy for you to say because you know I'll eventually get up and get you dressed. But who is going to take care of me? Jerry wanted to assure me he would, but he knew this wasn't the right time to offer those words. He wisely remained quiet. Later, he told me he thought, oh crap, she's right. A short time later, I begrudgingly rose long enough to get Jerry out of bed, dressed and in his wheelchair. He asked what I wanted for lunch. I made it clear that I did not care. He could figure it out and I rolled myself over to go back to sleep. From here, Jerry has to pick up the story and share what happens. He said he put his coat on, went out to his van to get ready to assume that caveman role of foraging for food for his family. But due to his late return the night before, his traveling companion didn't take the seat out of the van because the, the friend was driving. Um, and Jerry said, oh, that won't be any problem. Joan will take care of it tomorrow. So as Jerry went to go get in the van, he realized he could not get to the driver's area now because the seat was there. So he knew better than to come in the house and ask me to take it out. Mom was away and he looked around and he didn't see any neighbors on this Sunday morning. Things were looking kind of bleak. So he checked his wallet. He didn't have enough money to order food for delivery. And this was in the pre, uh, days before you could pay for food delivery by credit card. So considering the options, Jerry started to roll up town to a Wawa, only the best convenience store on the planet if you're not familiar with a Wawa. But he knew that he could get both food and cash there. So being a wise man, he filled the bags as full as he could and carried them home with a variety of sandwiches, salty and sweet surprises and anything else he thought I might like. When he got home, he cautiously entered our room I was oblivious to how long he was gone. Apparently, he told me it was about an hour and a half. Almost as if he were approaching a ravenous den of lions, which I'm sure is probably how he felt based on the way I'd reacted so far. He cautiously tossed the bag of food on the bed and told me I could have any or all of it. If there was anything left, he would eat then or he'd figure out another plan. I don't even remember now what I ate or if I left anything for him. I only recall that protein, salt, and sweet have never tasted as good as they did that day, and then a long time to sleep thereafter. I can honestly tell you that on the day of my crash, I was a caregiver who just didn't care. For a time, I wasn't even sure if I ever would again. But after some sleep and some distance from the crash point, Jerry and I put a few strategies in place to keep this from ever happening again, or at least to catch it quicker. The first one is that we try to keep our home well supplied. Now, that doesn't mean we ever run out of things for sure, but we try to keep a supply of some cash on hand. Um, we lived up north then, and so sometimes we needed it for somebody to shovel our driveway. Sometimes we needed it because somebody would drop some food or a supply off if I hit a little low point again and Jerry needed to order something and we wanted to be able to pay them. Whatever it might be, having both cash and trying to keep some reserve of some frozen food or something that was easy for him to be able to take out and cook in the microwave has been one way that we've been able to keep at least our family life going uh, as when I hit a point of being a caregiver who doesn't care. The next thing we realized we had to do was we had to build some margin. Okay, we had to choose um, to see, no, excuse me, let me backtrack on this. We needed to build some margin, okay? We did this in two ways. One is to not respond immediately. When I realize I'm nearing the end of my rope and I'm unsure if the knot at the end of that rope is gonna hold, I take some margin by saying, I need some time before I can answer that question or respond. Or I say, I need to complete what I'm doing right now for my own sanity 
before I can help you with what you need done today. Did that just this morning. Jerry texted me that he was awake and ready to get up out of bed. And they said, I'm in the middle of something, I need five minutes to complete this. And you know, in the previous years, I would have just dropped what I was doing, run to help him, come back later to do what I was doing. And that felt very frenzied for me a lot. So certainly if he needs me right away, he lets me know it's an emergency or he can't wait. But otherwise to say to him, I need a few minutes to say to your child, I'll be there to start that, that video game again for you or start that movie stream again or whatever it might be, but I need to finish what I'm doing. They may not like it, but they're going to survive for a few minutes, most all, often all the time. If you can just put some time in to say, I got to take care of my need right now for just a few minutes. The other margin we build in is around our schedule and travel. We're learning more to say no to things that run us back to back to back to back. We just, as we get older, we don't have the time and the energy to be able to keep rebounding as quickly as we need to just do a never ending schedule. So we now try to block at least one morning a week that we can sleep in if we need it. If we travel for business on a weekend, we try to make sure that we take a Monday or, or one other day that week at least off so we have a little bit of change. Even we do this for medical appointments. Sometimes it's good to plan a day of medical appointments if they're all at the same place, but other times if we have a week with just a couple appointments and somebody else wants to schedule, we say no, we'll need to go to the next week because we just know we need some of that margin. And that margin is both healthy for him, but it's healthy for me as a caregiver to be able to have some time for myself or just time to take a breath and not be racing all the time. You know, we also try to avoid extremes. I'm not always good at this. This story though hit me, or th this concept hit me when I was reading a story in the Old Testament in the Bible in Genesis 25. It's about Esau. You know, two of the extremes that I hit most often are ones that, that Esau hit, being hungry or angry and being exhausted. One of those two combined with my being, my being angry with when I'm either really tired or when I'm uh, exhausted or, or hungry, excuse me, really make for a fatal flaw and they did for Esau. The story goes that Esau spent the day hunting. It was something that he excelled at, but by the time he returned home, he was famished. He thought he was going to die. We've all said that, right? I'm so hungry I could die. Well, that's what Esau thought. We need to watch out when those things happen because by allowing himself to get to the point of being beyond hungry, Esau made a rash decision. In an effort to a full disclosure, there were a lot of other dynamics happening at the same time in this story, but isn't that how life goes? There's always a lot of things happening at once. Okay, it's rarely just one thing that trips us up. But as Esau came back from hunting and was famished, he came across his twin brother, Jacob, who was enjoying some stew. Now Esau was the older twin, Jacob the younger twin. The sight and the smell of that stew just enticed Esau, and he asked for a bowl. Jacob's response to his brother was that he would be glad to give him a bowl of stew if he would trade it for Esau's birthright. That was his role as the oldest brother and the future inheritance that would come his way. Well, Esau, again, feeling like he was going to die because he was so famished, thought that's reasonable. If I'm going to die anyway, I'm not going to have a chance to, to benefit from my role as the eldest brother or the inheritance. So he said yes, and he traded off his birthright for a bowl of stew. In hindsight, he didn't die, and that decision adversely affected the rest of his life. It couldn't be undone. The effects of his decision even overflowed to others in his family and in his community. That story is a really good caution for me. Esau and Jacob's lives changed forever by a rash decision that Esau made when he neglected self-care. When I lack margin or I'm hungry, tired, or cranky, it's a clue that it's time for me to take a step back and take care of myself before I make any critical decisions. Life and those around me will look different after I have a satisfied tummy, a rested body, or I've taken a walk around the block. When we live in the extremes, we're prone to make poor decisions. Another strategy would be to adjust your perspective, okay? 
When I think I can't do the same routine one more day, let alone for another 20 years, I tell myself, I don't have to do this forever. I just need to do it one more time. Often, by the time after that when I'm needed, I've been refreshed enough to be able to do it again without feeling like it's such a burden. Thinking of anything that's going to go on forever is mind-boggling. But for today, for this hour, I can do this. If you're a person of faith, this is a good time to fall on your faith to carry you through. I found myself standing outside the bedroom door sometimes and just uttering a quick prayer for strength and a smile on my face before I go in to provide care at that particular time. The other way I sometimes adjust my thinking is to realize that there will be a day when I won't be a caregiver anymore. I don't mean that to be morbid, but I don't want to get to that day and then feel guilty about what a grumpy caregiver I was or how I could have loved my husband better. If he passes before me, I want him to know that I gave him my all. I am certain that while I may experience more freedom and flexibility in my schedule at that point in time, I'm also gonna find myself missing the time we spent together while I was doing his care. Incidentally, this thinking goes beyond just time. No matter how hard he tries or how open of a floor plan we have, there are just certain places around our house that have chewed up wood, nicks in the paint or indents from coming that come from living a life with disability. I'm sad to admit that there have been some times that I've let those things get the better of me. I'm irked that my house doesn't look as nice as my neighbors, or so I think. I can drive our handyman crazy and keep him well, um, uh, well funded by continually asking for repairs. There's a place for that. But Jerry bought this house with his money as well as me with mine, and he lives in it the same as me. Someday I may wish there were marks being left around the house, but when I can remember that, I can appreciate today with much less stress, and I'm not getting hung up on those things. So adjusting my perspective. The other thing I need to adjust sometimes is my expectations. There was a time many years ago when we uh, were in a church with another couple who the husband had a disability. And a lot of the guys from church provided some uh, emergency care and even at, at one point some ongoing care for my husband uh, with his personal care routine in the morning so I could get a couple mornings off a week. It was awesome and they volunteered for that. They weren't paid. I know that's a rare situation, but we were blessed. But I remember talking to the wife of this couple and She's like, I don't get it. Why do people volunteer and want to come and do Jerry's care, but they won't come and do my husband's? And I wasn't sure. But as we started to talk to some of the guys who did Jerry's care, they said it was really about our expectations. Jerry was pretty low key and fluid. If his pant seam wasn't exactly centered, he could live with it for the day because he knew he was doing something good for me. In our friend's life, uh, my, the wife was a nurse and she had very high standards and that's a good thing. But the guys felt very intimidated because they could never live up to her standards. And so they were fearful to be a caregiver for that gentleman where they enjoyed being a caregiver, they told us, for Jerry. So adjust your expectations because it may provide more people to be able to come along and help support you and encourage things. Sometimes the expectation that needs to be adjusted is, you know what, I'm going to wear the same clothes two or three days in a row and we're going to survive. People aren't going to know or care and we're going to be okay. Or we're going to order food out tonight, even though I had a menu made for the week because I'm just shot and I can't do it tonight. Or saying, you know what, peanut butter and jelly sandwiches or a fried egg sandwich, that's a perfect dinner for tonight. So adjusting our expectations. You know, when we, I mentioned the word self-care, we talk about a little bit of a break. I know it's hard for us to often figure out as caregivers, how do we actually get a break? How do we do those things for self-care? So the next strategy is really to sit down and figure out what 
is the break or what kind of self-care can you get? It may not be a weekend. It may not be a full day. It may not be an hour even. But what kind of break can you get? For a time, I was doing what we called the weekend of Joan. Guys from church again would come help Terry for a weekend and I would go away, hang with friends or get a hotel or something and have that weekend on my own. But in the last year or two, Jerry's needs have changed and he needs care on a regular basis now throughout the day that he didn't need in the past, or at least he needs my help to do things. So it's really not reasonable or in the cards anymore that I can do an overnight trip or uh, that kind of thing. But what I can do is we can make a plan that I get up, I get him in his chair, and then the rest of the day, other than those, the times he needs me throughout the day are brief, but they're regular. So I can be available to do that, but otherwise I don't do it. If he drops something, it stays on the floor that day or whatever else it might be. The rest of the day is mine. I can be out in the hammock all day and, and lay and take a nap and I, I might get him back to bed that night. If we're going to eat together, he's going to take care of doing all the food on those days. So whatever it might be, whether it's a, a few hours to do a puzzle or a write or a nap or walk or whatever, find something that you can do on a semi-regular basis to just give yourself a little space to fill back up that emotional meter so you're not always uh, feeling like you're running on empty. For those times that we can't, I can't get away, especially now anymore, I try to think in terms of really small incremental breaks. What is it that I can do for five minutes? I have a list of things on my refrigerator of how to take a quick break. Sometimes it's reading a page, just one page in a book. Sometimes it's just texting um, a friend and checking in on them and having, letting them know that I'm still alive. Uh, maybe it's watching my favorite song on YouTube. It doesn't take more than a couple minutes, but it changes my attitude and gives me the thought that I've just done something for me. It encourages me. And honestly, even if your child or your spouse or your sibling who you're caring for feels like they can't wait the two minutes or five minutes while you're doing that to get your, your help, most likely they will. And whether they admit it or not, they're going to notice the difference in you because you've taken a few minutes for yourself. So, so look and develop those really quick one to five minute kind of breaks you can take and acknowledge those that you had that chance. Another one is remember that while it's not all about you, it isn't part about you. If you go down, everyone goes down. Your kids aren't going to go down the wrong path in life most, life most likely because you did something for yourself on occasion. I remember one mom saying while her daughter was asleep in the car, she went through Dairy Queen and got what she wanted and didn't get anything for her daughter who was sleeping. And when the daughter woke up, she was just so mad at mom because there was a Dairy Queen cup and she hadn't gotten anything. You know what? Kudos to that mom who did something that was special for her. Um, you know, you don't have to, when you're offering to the kids that you're going to go out for dinner tonight, you don't have to just give them a choice between uh, McDonald's and Chick-fil-A or whatever your favorite might be. It's okay to give them a choice with, you know, Panera and, I don't know, Crispers, whatever, wherever you live and whatever is a place that you enjoy. You can still give them a choice, but make it a choice of the two things that would be encouraging and a blessing for you that day instead of it always having to be about them. You can choose the radio station in the car for a chance. You choose the movie that streams for them to watch because you just can't hear the, the voice of whoever in that cartoon movie one more time. While you're on the hold with the insurance company for the 15th time, play a game on your phone or on your computer or listen to a favorite audiobook. Whatever you choose, you know, refresh yourself for a few minutes uh, and remember that, that, that it is about you in part as well. So do something for yourself. You know, and recognize that there's not necessarily a right or a wrong way of doing caregiving. When my dad was uh, in hospice, my sister and I would sometimes get frustrated with one another, though we didn't, we probably didn't talk about it a lot, but you could kind of tell that we were each doing things differently for dad. And one night Jerry told me, you know, you and Ginny are both doing a really good job taking care of your dad, but you each do it differently and that's okay. You know, it's tough as a, enough as a caregiver when we compare ourselves. But 
when we look at another caregiver and say, oh my goodness, they, they get to take a break. How come I don't get to do that? Or they get, they just got their house painted and I can't even get enough money to, to buy a new coloring book or whatever it is. Um, you know, look, uh, yeah, just, just give yourself a little bit of, of space there and don't compare yourself to the other caregivers because there's no right or wrong way to be a caregiver. My last strategy for you is to live in grace. Grace is sometimes defined as courteous goodwill. And when I encourage you to live in grace, I'd like to encourage you to start with yourself. Give yourself some grace. On those days when nothing will work or the situation can't change, remember this is passing. You can admit it to yourself or to your journal or trusted confident right now that life sucks, that it really hurts, and you're done. You can say it. You can wallow in it for a brief time, and I do mean brief. Set a timer and say in 15 minutes or in 30 minutes, I'm done. I'm going to feel bad about this right now, but then I'm done, and I'm going to get up, and I'm going to live in grace. I'm going to give myself and my family courteous goodwill to move forward. You know, I just wanted to say a couple words to friends who may be listening who are also, um, who maybe don't have somebody they love who's a care, who, who they provide care for, but they love a caregiver friend of theirs. You know, a lot of times we're just not sure what to do as being a friend of a caregiver. We hear stories and we think it, it can't possibly be that hard. Aren't there lots of places that you can get services from or do this or that or, or find help? I'm just here to tell you, it's really not that easy to be, um, to get services or do those kinds of things. Um, there, there's just more that we need than what people can provide. So here's a few things you can do, friends, for us. Be present. Just hang out with us. Even if it looks like you don't have any time to, to talk or do anything, but just having somebody else around just is a lift to my spirit. Invite people to come to your house, to your events that you go to in your community. Um, be okay inviting them to church, knowing that the kid's going to make a little more noise. Be okay uh, inviting them to a pool party where maybe you think people are going to get splashed more or whatever else is going on. But invite people to become a part of your circle and welcome them in. Listen to what's going on. Really listen to the caregiver's heart. And try not to do it with a judgment, but just be able to listen and let go. Because they just need to be able to, to blow off some steam sometimes. Offer to learn the routines that they have going on and then offer to help. <clears throat> excuse me, and then know, realize that there are things that you don't know and you probably never will, and that's okay, but try not to, to present yourself as the expert in their life from what you've seen from the outside. Know what you don't know and just encourage your friend there as they, as they care give throughout the time. But we need you, friends, so please don't run away or leave us because it looks scary or hard. We need you there in our lives. Well, I'm going to wrap up this session by introducing you to my handsome husband, Jerry, and inviting him to have the last word. Thanks for joining me, and I do encourage you to please get in touch with me. I, I'd love to hear your story as a caregiver. I'd love to hear your story as a friend of a caregiver. So give me a call or email me at Joan at loop14exchange.org. So here you have my husband, Jerry Wharton. Hi, my name is Jerry Wharton. I'm married to Joan. I uh, also work with her at Loop 14 Exchange. I want to do something for you to do. I've spent my entire life doing some incredible things but the ability to do those things is because I had someone with me who could care for my needs, my mother, uh, sometimes my brother and sister, sometimes aunt and uncle and grandparents, um, a co-worker, all different kinds of caregivers. Here's something I know not every individual who needs and receives care think to say thank you not everybody who needs or receives care is able to thank you or 
remembers to thank you. So would you do me the honor of thanking you for them? Because of your care, our world is much, much brighter. Because of your care, we're able to be less isolated. Because of your care, we have the opportunity to become who we actually are. So thank you. It means the world to the person you're caring for. And by the way, it means the world to those of us at Luke 14 Exchange. Let me say it one more time. Thank you.